it and just heard the IT directors banter over the dinner about you know can't let these buggers get access to everything I don't know what they're talking about all these educators and it, it is a cultural mismatch but I, I think we're getting there in a lot of places certainly devices like iPod touch and iPhone we've seen social networking software people rewrite the interface and that's very cool. So Facebook has a little interface uh, there. It's, there's nothing really to it. You just your web page is just basically fits for it. The introduction to new um, iPad touches and being able to then utilise those in a school prep placement where students take out their mobile devices to schools and can then showcase what they can do to their supervising teachers and their students in a much more effective way than has been done in the past. Of course, we're really waiting for the iPhone itself so that we can use it not only as a presentation device, but also as a recording device, where we can use the facilities for it to capture video, images, and of course audio. So that education uh, faculty is certainly looking and have trialled, they've bought 20 or so iPod touches to start seeing how it can be used and explore the way that these devices can be used. And the idea of using them in prac placements is quite interesting. So this really is a match made in heaven for our mantra of um, create, distribute, access, collaborate. Now the tools you would use, I just want to spend a second talking about tools for content creation. They start from somewhat labour intensive tools. Every Mac has iLife. iLife basically has GarageBand where you can whip up things like podcasts, movies, photos and the beauty is they all fit together. So if you're using GarageBand you'll see the photos in iPhoto, it will all magically happen. And using these sorts of tools through the software iTunes, you basically have a great way of distribute. In the mantra, create, access, distribute. So for distribution, mobile devices including iPod Touch can use this sort of freebie software. Now who here, be honest because it's always interesting to see, does not use iTunes software? Alright, three, four. So there are four folks in this room that don't. So because it's on the PC and the Mac, of course, it's available. Now this has implications, I think, for other directions uh, that are coming down the line I'll spoke, speak about right now, which is podcasting. So students at uh, Griffith uh, have access to a number of podcasts, as they do at Swinburne and a number, number of other universities. Uh, and the preferred uh, software is the, uh, the iTunes you'll see down there at the bottom. And that's kind of predictable podcast material, guest lecturers. Uh, they've got it in different formats, so you can download in different ways. But where it gets really interesting is when you look at what they've got up on the music store, the iTunes music store. So Griffith has have uh, currently about six uh, different pieces of material. Let's think of them as TV channels. Six channels up on the iTunes Music Store. It's free. The stuff still sits at Griffith. It's just an RSS feed. That's enough for jargon. Um, they've got different sorts of material. They've got uh, the library has tours, so you put it on your little iPod and you can walk around the library. They've got it in Arabic, uh, Putungwa, and English, uh, and you can basically. Wa oh, an Arab. Yes, no, that's it. I think. Where it gets really interesting, they have e-learning materials, so students actually are posting podcasts, they're creating music um, in the con, and they're actually creating a podcast instead of writing a paper about that piece of music. Getting really interesting. Now, it's not all rocket science. Schools are doing this stuff, and I'm going to pick on a little school called Orange Grove Primary. If you haven't heard of them, they're interesting. Their first podcast was back in Feb 06. We'll hear from the teacher why he used podcasts. But it's interesting, in that time, they've gone from having one or two computers in a very small school, 121 students, to basically now going to a, years four to seven, a one-to-one -one program, so a notebook program. It's quite interesting to see where it's gone. Here's a bit of background on the school, created by themselves. It's a small school. You're listening to Pop Kids Australia. Episode 5, May 2006. I 
started podcasting with my year four or five class about four months ago because I wanted to create a real purpose for their lives. I had a hunch that if we created this authentic worldwide audience, the students would become more engaged, they would plan their writing more carefully, they would reflect more on their writing, and their literacy skills would be improved, which is the focus. Now, I won't continue, but Paul has some good points there. It goes on to actually hear from the kids. And talking about engagement, you know, there was a kid who says, I had trouble writing two lines, but now I know, and these guys are getting like 12,000 hits regularly around the planet to their podcasts uh, up on the music store. They ha they, they're engaged. That kid is now writing a script for the podcast. He's writing a page, two pages. So it's really engaged them, and it's authentic learning. So iTunes works in this way when you use it with a mobile device. You basically can use your own music or you can go to the store and purchase music. That synchronises with your copy of iTunes, it then synchronises with your iPod Touch or your other device and when it comes the iPhone. Something new coming down the line um, this year. It's called iTunes U and it's relevant to universities. In fact, that's what U stands for. It's the same user interface. Now, when I asked you how many people are using iTunes, there was a cunning reason for that, which was to illustrate the point that it's all about user interface. The experience of using iTunes U is the same as most people have already. It's just using iTunes software. So you would go to, say, Stanford, pick your diplomacy lecture or channel. It syncs with iTunes. It automatically syncs with your iPod or your iPod Touch. The same user interface that students are used to, which is really interesting stuff. So iTunes U looks something like this. Here's Stanford's presence on iTunes U, currently available only in North America. About 800 universities have taken advantage of it. Um, a large number of them have totally appalling content, but uh, another large number have really interesting content up there. So Stanford was part of the pilot in the US, as was Duke, as was MIT and Berkeley. Heaps of material there, and of course the open courseware project at MIT makes it uh, interesting as well to see the disciplines they've got there. This res these resources are available to K-12 teachers as well, so MIT have a lot of resources up online. I'd actually like to have a gamble here. Um, the network wasn't working when I started this talk. I'm now going to sit down and see if, it's, uh, if my Ethernet IP address has gone on the network. So we'll do that. No, we won't, but I'm not going to because it's not doing a darn thing. The network is down. I'd like you to look at uh, iTunes U. Now, to do that, you would go to... Don't be a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is the cause, the blue Ethernet cable flaky network. I'm not going to plug anything back in. You've got to be kidding. Seriously, thank you Dave, I'll do that. I want you to have a look at iTunes U. Um, just go to the music store. So open up iTunes, go to the music store in the left hand column. Again, in the music store in the left hand column is iTunes U. I'm giving you a verbal description of what I'm doing in a demo here. I'd then like you to have a look also to Beyond Campus. So there are a bunch of institutions like uh, Smithsonian that have a presence there. So they, their digital library is available for folks. And just have a look at the podcast. Now, who here does listen to or use or subscribe to podcasts? Just so I get an idea. It's about half of you. I guess it's not surprising in a group that's interested in e-learning. Um, look, I don't think the, the research that uh, Bev Oliver had was actually as realistic as it could be. I think much more than 29% of students... Isn't that a nice shot? I love that shot. It's depth. It's a good shot. Um, I think, Bev, um, the numbers are higher. Certainly when walking around any campus, I see a huge number of white headsets. An interesting little fact, over 65% of the MP3 players in Australia and New Zealand are iPods. So this user interface is certainly well known to them. Right. Did that sort of drag it on long enough so that I can get back to the talk? I think it did. Questions at this stage? Might be a good time to change the tape too, do you think, David? Yeah. What was the URL you were saying for iTunes? I'm looking at iTunes, apple.com, iTunes overview. You don't have the iTunes software? Installed? Yeah. 
No, because I don't know what's doing. Okay. I don't trust if it. you you trust it. Okay. If uh, when you're when you've got the bandwidth to do it, um, there'll be a link to the iTunes software. You need that. So iTunes is the software that will allow you to get to iTunes. You. So you will need to download uh, iTunes. Can I blame this video um, cable? There we are. Back to it. Okay. New product. Talking about creating content, the manual product I mentioned, iLife, is a very manual process. You have to sit there and create podcasts. Now, a number of people are doing that, and it's really high quality stuff. But there's software out there like Podcast Producer that automates the process. Is Monash a uh, Lectopia site? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, not using it a great deal? Yeah. College of Pharmacy is so yeah. Okay. Yeah, and who else we got here? We've got Swinburne, you guys are, and it's being used. Yeah? RMIT's got it. Okay. So a lot of folks have got it. Look, the two are not, uh, do not compete. Podcast producer is really all about automating the, the podcasting, but it's much more than that. It's actually a workflow system. And we're going to show that to you soon to give you an idea. A number of universities are using it. I'm going to be visiting Berkeley uh, next month and have a look at what they've done with podcast producer. Oxford are doing some cool stuff. The Bodleian Library is wanting to digitise much of their, uh, their resources and make it available, and they're using podcast producer. Here's how it, you might use podcast producer in the classroom. Now, it was originally developed in France uh, and the University of Lyon have been uh, using it for some time, so I thought we might have a snapshot of them and see how they're using it. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Cheers. What we're seeing here is him setting up the blog server, so it's not rocket science. Blended learning. Subscribe to the RSS feed. Now using iTunes, where it will sync. And synchronize with her iPod. And voila. How very French. Now, Lectopia is certainly being used uh, by about half of the universities in Australia. In Australia. Griffith and UQ just jumped on the bandwagon uh, last semester last year. Um, hugely powerful stuff. And if you're talking about scaling up automated systems that will fit into podcasting scenarios, Lectopia is great. In fact, they're going to have a lovely little plug-in this year for iTunes U. So it's going to be nice and easy to, we've been working with them, to make it happen when iTunes U comes to Australia. Students are not missing out on lectures because it's available online. This software was developed at the University of Western Australia years ago. And their research is telling us that 64% of the students find this material essential. And the other interesting bit of data is down the bottom, which I think is that 65% of the students are using it in revision week. Now, maybe they're missing lectures and then using this to catch up, but I think it's revision is how they're doing it. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm going to actually cross over to my dear colleague. Now, I've spoken about this thing called a wiki server. We've got one. In fact, we've got a server here, so we've put the server software, it's also a Unix operating system, it can work on that, and we've got a client machine. So I'm going to swap over, which I've done, and away we go. Okay, so what I'm just going to very briefly take you through is uh, the wiki server and uh, 
and that, how that applies to you guys in a learning environment. So what I'm going to do is uh, first of all launch this new application called Directory. This is something that's uh, new to Leopard. So uh, for those of you running Leopard on your own machines, you'll have this installed by default as part of the system. What Directory does is it allows you to set up uh, users and groups. Uh, and these can tie into accounts that exist in your campus-wide structure if you've got Active, Active Directory or Novell or something along those lines happening. Uh, it allows the teacher to leverage those accounts and make the groups themselves uh, to set up to use these services. So traditionally, uh, I've worked in a university uh, environment as well. I'm originally from Perth. I was at ECU there. It was very difficult for teachers to be able to get certain things enabled, like a group made with their students, so that they could do these things because there would be a lot of pushback from the central IT department. So what's great about uh, this application is that uh, we can set it up so that the teachers are able to do these things and make these edits themselves uh, without actually having to go uh, via the IT department. So in this example, uh, we're going to make a new group for, um, for a wiki. So I'm going to go down here and make a new group. Uh, and uh, let's say I'm a primary school teacher here, so uh, we're going to call this, uh, this is my year six uh, it's, it's class on gold. Okay, this is the subject we're teaching. Uh, my description here, uh, this can be Justin's class teaching gold. You can put anything in there. And now here's where we uh, actually add our students into this group here. So uh, I'm going to hit the plus button here. Uh, I've just got the one student in here, so Valentine will drag her in there. Got a couple of options here. We can publish the membership list. That means uh, allow other people to see who's in this class. Uh, this could be useful for certain types of groups that we're doing. We won't be doing that today. Uh, you can also allow people to self-add themselves to a group. And again, you can think of cases where that would be uh, uh, particularly useful, say, not so much in a strict class setting, but more of a general topic, and you wanted all sorts of students to uh, be able to opt in or opt out of the group. So uh, that's also very handy, and they don't need to go through a help desk for that sort of stuff. So we look at the uh, services I'm going to enable here. There's a couple there. Uh, we're just going to do the wiki and blog today. I'll go ahead and press save. Okay, so it's done that now, and it's put the link in there for the wiki automatically. So if I click on that, it brings up Safari, our web browser. It's gone directly to where the wiki is. I'm now going to log in as the student. So that was the person that we put in the, uh, in the group there. So you can see that uh, it's secure as well. It's not open for everyone to uh, go in and do their own bits and pieces. And it set that up automatically. So um, we've got that template there. You can change that and uh, change the images in there. There's a bunch of templates that are built into that, or you could change it to reflect the uh, particular environment, your school with logos and so on. Uh, so it's just put some dummy text in there and telling you what to do. So uh, first time users get an idea straight away what they're going to do. I'm just going to click the pencil button here so that we can go away and edit that. Now I'll get rid of that text that's in there. I've got some pre-prepared text here so uh, you don't have to watch me uh, typing all that in. I'll just copy and paste that straight in here. So talking about gold, uh, let's uh, just make these headings look a little bit, a little bit better there. We can uh, do all the standard sort of text editing here. Uh, we'll also interpret the usual just uh, command B uh, for bolding. So uh, very similar to what they would be used to using in Word and other text editors. So uh, we call this uh, WYSIWYG interface. So what you see is what you get. Uh, WYSIWYG was a word that was very common probably 10 years ago, more in desktop publishing, and now it's sort of making a bit of a comeback these days. So uh, we've made some um, edits in there. I'm just going to put a comment in here so that we know uh, this session here what I'm doing. So I'll just go, uh, this is my initial answers. So uh, this student, they've gone away. Uh, the teacher's done the class. They're now um, putting in some answers to the topics that they talked about here. I'll click Save. 
So that's done and it's static like that. Now, as a teacher, you can now go in and you can see, uh, we see here, this is when it was done. It was done by Valentine. Uh, this is the answer that she's come back with. Okay. Um, now what this means is that you get that instant feedback on what that student's had during that class or the research that they might have gone and done and uh, you're able to then get that direct feedback. So in this case there's, a, uh, there's some information there but it could probably be a bit better here. So let's say uh, you've now gone and talked about that with the student. Uh, they're going to make those changes uh, and update that. So I'll go back and edit this again. So what is gold? Uh, what has gold been used for? Uh, so it's not just fake teeth. We could say uh, it is also uh, widely used in electronics. I should probably try and spell correctly in front of uh, Atho, I think, otherwise. No. And uh, the largest deposits of gold have not actually been found in regional Victoria, uh, although there was a lot here. Uh, the largest have actually been in South Africa, in Johannesburg. So we could also uh, put in a picture or something along those lines or uh, different links to go off to other websites as well. So you can also bring in other bits of media and this becomes a, a bit more of a uh, less of a static page uh, and a lot more interesting. So I'll put in comment here saying uh, this is my revised text. Okay, so you could also have like a draft, first revision and so on. Uh, it's good to keep track of those things. So I'll hit save and see that's instantly updated those things. Now, this is where it gets very cool. So, teacher comes in here. Uh, we can see this is what the page looks like at the moment. If we come up here and click this little button here, view document history, it folds down and I can see those previous versions. So if I click back to this one, now I'm seeing the previous version. So what's great is from a teaching point of view is I can see how the students learn over time. So you can imagine if there was 10 versions of that in there, you can see how they're learning and changing and what their thought process is as they go through.